Hi. Hi, Amy. How are you doing? Hey, Sophie. I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Let's get going. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 13th annual in-house creative industry benchmarking webinar. This is our 13th year running the survey, but first we've expanded to include marketing. Um, last year, we discussed the new normal. Everyone's heard enough about COVID. So this year, you'll see some more of what our new normal actually is and how to measure for success. So let's jump in. For those of you who I have not yet had the pleasure to meet, I'm Sophie Regulus, and I'm the Managing Director of our Seller Consulting line of business. Today, I'm joined by Amy Strickland. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I know an hour is a lot to ask, so we will make it worth your while. I am the Director of Marketing Operations Consulting for Sella, um, and we are really excited to share some valuable insights today, um, including uh, some of the changes that we've made to the surveys this year and the interesting data that's come out of them. So we start off with a bit of a background on who Sella is. Um, so this year, we're super excited to let you know that we were acquired by Randstad last year. The acquisition actually provides us with the ability to support organizations globally while still remaining nimble as the independent business we once were. For those unfamiliar with Seller, we are positioned as an end-to-end -end, um, solutions provider with three main pillars for our business. The first pillar is listed here is our consulting practice. And this is where we have the opportunity to support your marketing, creative and digital departments by creating um, strategic operational excellence through org design, process improvements, financial viability, and the supporting technology infrastructure. Next up is our talent solutions area, which is comprised of staffing, um, and our staffing practice specializes in freelance, full-time, as well as executive search within that creative digital and marketing space. We also have our managed solutions in our talent solutions area, where we can build and manage team within that creative and digital space, either from a single stream of work or act as your AOR. Finally, our newest offering, The Bench. The Bench is our overflowed production studio. It's super useful for rapid execution, extending specialty services, and getting that three-tier production work off your more strategic creative designers. So now that we've finished with our shameless plug for today, um, I'm gonna let you know that across the next 45 minutes, Amy and I are gonna be sharing with you some background on this year's survey, um, a state of the union, kind of how things shook out, benchmarking our new normal, no mention of COVID, um, the benchmarking measurement, understanding operational maturity, and then really understanding what we see as next on the horizon for the marketing and creative departments. Following the presentation, we are going to have um, the balance of time to respond to any questions that might come up throughout the, the presentation. However, if you have a question and you don't want to lose it, please go ahead and enter it in the um, questions pane in the control panel. In that area, um, we're going to be seeing, or you'll see that um, David Iscove and Sue Wolski, two of our most senior um, consultants, uh, answer some questions for you in that chat. And again, we'll take some more at the end. So um, thank you to everybody who took an average of 20 minutes to respond to the survey this year. It's an intense questionnaire, we get it, but it really does give us great insight to our in-house agency operations. So you see here the general topics that we survey, and you also see at the bottom there, the new areas that we expanded into, um, marketing uh, measurement topics. And this is gonna give us a more thorough view of the creative and marketing team operations. We are really excited to get into these benchmark stats. This year, um, nearly 400 people responded to our survey. We then had to narrow down those respondents by filtering out things like people from non-leadership, as well as those submitted by external agencies. And in addition, we filter out responses for people that don't actually work in the creative and marketing role. Our goal here is for each response to represent one in-house agency. And we just believe that that's best done through some senior leaders. 
So we're going to be looking at the data today from over 241,000 companies, all of which have a revenue somewhere between that 250 million to 30 billion um, target. Each year, uh, for those who have seen our surveys before, um, we feature articles written by leaders in the field. And this year, we have eight different um, perspectives. I'm not going to read them all here. You can see them. But honestly, I think this might be some of our best um, uh, topics that we have. And I'm you're going to see them in the book. And I'm really happy for you to uh, get some of these insights. We want to just maximize the most time we have here to get into our next this year's survey results. So without further ado, let's jump into the State of the Union. Last year, we saw a shift in the C-suite level alignment between the CEOs and the CMOs. We knew that the collaboration and alignment would trickle down and trickle down it has. Overall, this year's State of the Union is driven by the integration and collaboration between those marketing and creative departments. Yeah, and so we've seen and many of us have experienced some form of reorgs within our companies recently. Um, one notable movement for our in-house and client side brand and marketing teams is that more in-house creative teams have been moved away from hybrid and communications reporting structures toward directly reporting to a marketing leader. In fact, almost 70% now are reporting into marketing, which is a jump of more than 20% since last year. And while the majority of those in-house creative services teams are still referred to as something like creative services, creative studio, creative team, interestingly, we have started to see an increase in giving those uh, an, a unique branded name to the agency. So some examples might be Ironworks at Caterpillar, Blue House at Chevron, and of course, Yellow Shoes at Disney. This branded naming practice is up from sixth position last year to third position this year. And we're thinking this might be a response partly to creative teams now reporting into marketing and a need to differentiate how they're referred to. Um, something we'll definitely be keeping an eye on going forward. Absolutely. So um, when we look at how teams are funded, so from the funding model perspective, we've actually seen there's over a 10% decrease in chargeback and partial chargeback. Yeah, I, to me, this feels like one of those all for one, one for all approach with creative and marketing very possibly deciding together to move away from chargeback and partial chargeback into more centrally funded or, or shared service models. Um, you know, instead of silos, it supports that collaborative approach between creative and marketing um, that's really key to delivering omni-channel. I guess this could also be seen as a response to the current environment, uh, you know, finding ways to be more financially responsible, which I think kind of goes hand in hand with the increase in organizations providing their services at specific hourly rates rather than a blended rate. What we've seen right now is that of the 80% that are charged back or partial charged back, around 57% are charging a service-specific hourly rate um, and just 33% on a branded rate. In general, we saw a drop in the use of flat rate from about 12% to 5%. And surprisingly, the blended hourly rate um, went down also from 46 to 33%. And the increase in the use of that specific um, service-specific hourly rate actually increased from 38% to 57% from last year. So kind of like digging down a little deeper into that, of that 33% who are actually sticking with a blended hourly rate, we can actually see that there's also been an overall reduction in the value of that hourly rate from the 81 to $100 an hour being charged last year to the majority having that more cost efficient 66 to $80 an hour range. So up until now, that 81 to 100 dollar rate had really reigned supreme. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that drop to the um, highest percentage line drop to that lower tier, which, again, I think is quite interesting. And I think may fold into that kind of all for one and one for all approach with marketing, you know, thinking more about 
partnering versus profiting. I see that also, you know, related to the workload and balance of services, there's also been a 10% increase over the last year of teams they have included in the planning and uh, working into that tier one scope. Although this work also likely includes tier two and tier three, um, which I think is really interesting. We're seeing that increase from 21, 22, going up 42, 44% now to that 55%, which is great news for our creators and our in-house agency. So all of this kind of like new work, bringing in the stronger partnership with, with marketing is leading to a new diversity of services that we're seeing as a requirement for in-house agencies. And there's now an interesting situation that we're experiencing, and that's what do we do with the talent required to support all of these services that are increasing? Um, and uh, there's a decreasing in the skill set that's trying to keep pace with the demand for this omni-channel approach. My sympathy right now is with hiring managers. They're going to have to be a lot more resourceful on how they acquire and then manage that all-important talent mix. So when we're thinking about offshoring, just to figure out how we can get this diverse set of services um, offered to our clients, we looked at this question and we changed it just a little bit. We changed this question to break out external agency and offshore from the kind of just outsource services. Um, we'll see more on year on year data next year. Um, you can just kind of see where they are this year. However, even so, it is clear that offshoring actually has increased as a way to expand the, the dedicated team and as a support for specialized skill sets. There's also a slight increase in satisfaction. Um, conversely, we actually saw a kind of um, lower satisfaction mark for using external agencies um, at coming in at around that 11% mark. Yeah, and, and managing those offshore partners seems to be kind of a struggle overall, particularly with communication, brand knowledge, time zone challenges, you know, com coming in at the top. And likely for these reasons, their value seems to be largely in additional dedicated hands and the lower cost of those resources. We are still looking to our agency partners for support. However, the primary use of those external agencies has sort of evolved from really primarily overflow support to 50% of teams leaning on them for niche work and 47% for very specific assignments and projects. You know, we, we did also see an increase um, in the use of external agency partners in the production of tier one work, specifically for strategy. And then that um, execution work, we were actually seeing that work remaining in-house. So overall, the in-house agency team sizes actually do appear to be growing, specifically in teams with um, 20 or less. Those people are reducing in size. However, the teams with 21 people or more have actually increased. We're, we're seeing um, some double percent shift increases specifically in that 31 to 50 team size and again in the 51 to 75 uh, team size for the number of studio resources. So um, just remember this data. So this is actually one of those key slides. It's a key metric and we're going to be referring back to it a few times today because it actually has um, some impact on some other key points. Yeah, it's the bigs are getting bigger and the smalls are getting smaller. Yeah. Um, and that, that impacts to that exact point, Amy, that, that impacts the number of increased projects we're seeing. So year on year, we're asked to do more. But this time we're being asked to do more and we have a whole bunch of increases in team size. So it makes better sense that we're seeing a clear jump in the large accounts of projects from that 3,000 Plus, you actually see for the first time, I think, in that first yellow block, the, the switch in the uptick of the uh, number of projects coming in. But at least this time, it's in alignment with the team size. So I feel like there may be some hope there for some uh, 
balance between workload and resources. So when we have a look at the roles that we're looking for in the marketplace right now, looks like it's a bit of a tough market for our graphic designers. There's a perception of an abundance of highly qualified talent on the market this year, shifting from 11% to 22%. Um, year on year. And that's a that's also a big slowdown on the hiring. Last year, we saw that hiring at 23%. And now it's down to three. There also seems to be a rather lower or a lower emphasis on account management and art director roles, even when there's a higher level of more strategic work coming in. Um, and, and that's also in high demand in many of these teams. As opposed to the relatively similar shift for art directors, digital designers and copywriting talent, who are now viewed as having a more limited resource, um, we're putting that down to that growing content hungry marketplace of today. Yeah, I totally agree. Content marketing is still very much on the rise. And I think it's likely that that is fueling some of this higher need for copy and ratio to, to graphics. Yeah, totally. So when we talk about prioritization of projects and, and how folks think about that, this result was actually a pleasant surprise, but also a little bit of a puzzle. So 65% of teams are saying that deadline is the primary driver of prioritization for their projects. Totally get that. But that's bookended by 68% of teams saying strategic importance is number one, and 38% saying that ROI and revenue are the most important. What isn't clear yet is how teams are determining or receiving the information on, on strategy or revenue. It could be that creative and marketing are working directly together. Um, maybe creatives are being pulled into discussions further upstream or possibly prioritization is happening in marketing and then being pushed to creative. Um, possibly they have a marketing operations team who works to bridge that gap. Um, dedica dedicated marketing ops um, wasn't part of our State of the Union last year, um, but we'll definitely be looking at that as we move through 2023 to sort of piece this prioritization puzzle together. So this is our final State of the Union slide stats, and we're looking at how we're sharing assets. And I see that people are still relying on email to share files. Come on, people. We really have to move ourselves off email sharing files. We would love to see that number decrease. So what are we doing? What are our options coming up behind? Well, Microsoft's OneDrive and SharePoint, those solutions are kind of standing in for the bulk of the rest. And then there are really kind of those standard enterprise true DAM systems coming in in fourth place at 48%. And we're going to dig into that in just... Um, a little bit further on. Please, let's not do the emails anymore. <laughs> let's get into benchmarking our new normal. So from what we know about the state, oh, sorry, people, there we go. So from what we know about the state of the union, what exactly do we think is part of the new normal? Yeah, I mean, we are definitely seeing a deeper connection happening between marketing and creative. We see consumers demanding more emotional connections to messages, as well as expecting us to reach them where and how they want to be reached. So all of these factors are driving the push toward a true omni-channel approach and the evolution of the new normal. Despite layoffs in some industries, we are seeing still a very tight talent market um, overall. Many of us, our, ourselves included, got a taste for flexibility in our work days, and, and no one wants to lose that. We also started seeing folks learning um, the value of learning and development increasing in a new way. Um, and we continue to see a steady uptick in interest for training and development programs. 70%, in fact, of IHAs and marketing departments surveyed were offering a formal training and development program, and over 80% are spending the same or more than last year on those. So that's definitely great to see. It's a pretty small investment that is uh, highly effective in keeping that talent motivated and upskilling them along the way. It is so great to see. Um, so... 
As we called out in the State of the Union, team sizes are growing. In fact, the very large teams of 30 plus and more are growing the most. The smaller teams of less than 20 are down. We really believe that this is because in-house agencies and marketing departments are being asked to provide a deeper and broader set of services in order to meet expectations. Um, of the true, you know, the, the, the omni-channel approach is really pushing the boundary on lots of services, but it's no surprise to keep seeing that video, motion graphics, and the related services to those are really still uh, at the top of the list of ones expected to grow and I think is going to continue in our new normal state. Another key characteristic that we believe is the new normal is actually a much shorter planning horizon. In yeah, you can see in fact, that, it's about half, Sophie, of what it traditionally was. Wow. 64% of teams are planning between one and six months out, and only 10% are planning a year or more, which is really different, obviously, from times gone by. So we started wondering if this is the death of annual planning. Um, you know, IHAs and marketing departments are working at the speed of culture, and we know they're delivering more services, as you pointed out before, and they're delivering more projects, as you pointed out before, in that same short time frame. So it's, it's no wonder that folks uh, cite balancing competing priorities and too little time for creativity at the top of the challenges that they're facing. Um, the, the positive here on the plus side is that 49% of IHAs say they're involved in the planning process. So the planning that they are doing is actually gonna be more successful, more relevant, because not only is it shorter term, it's also taking place through partnership. So there are fewer surprises, more collaboration, and plus the in-house agency is better able to plan for resources because they know what's coming and when, which as you know, is kind of the holy grail. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited about this this little trend that we're seeing here you know not only as you said like short-term planning with collaboration between marketing and creative looking like it's becoming a new normal but i i really believe that this is highly likely that this here is going to become an industry best practice yeah i, I totally agree i don't think we're going to see this planning horizon stretching back out again now that folks are used to it. So in the in the new normal, teams will need to find ways to adapt and get more efficient and, and also set the right expectations with their partners. You know, I wanted to call out here that, you know, we can see that 36% of teams don't use service level agreements. And it's concerning, right? Because this is such a great time where we're having this collaboration through marketing and creative. Um, and this is a massively missed opportunity. It's it's one of the leading sources of misalignment between marketers and the expectations of the in-houses, um, in-house agencies' ability to deliver. With the collaboration going so well, I think we need to keep an eye on this um, so that we can really help people improve their SLA so that we don't slip backwards. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, as we stated earlier, it is most common now for IHAs to report into a marketing leader and for teams to be centrally funded or a shared service. So we expect this trend to stick as part of the new normal. This type of setup, though, really requires strategic prioritization of work and budget at a higher level. And it demands tighter collab between marketers, creatives, channels, analytics, so here is where we see marketing operations entering in. For those of you in B2B, I know this is often defined as demand gen and, and lead scoring, but here we're talking about a much broader definition of marketing ops as supporting the entire marketing department's ability to plan, execute, and measure marketing activities. They're really the hub of the spokes. Um, so they are perfectly positioned to prioritize and activate the right projects, deploy the budget across the right channels and, and have that strategic vision and strategic approach. 
We're seeing though that 36% of teams don't yet have a dedicated marketing ops role. So we are expecting this gap to close pretty quickly in the new normal as marketing ops becomes necessary as that linchpin. So let's have a look at technology and adoption and how is, how is work getting done? Obviously, we discovered that some people are, are uh, still using email to share files. And it's just a little personal twitch for me. But for those not using email to store and share their assets, we are still seeing that um, some asset management systems such as Microsoft and with their SharePoint and Teams solutions, they're actually still out driving currently the Adobe Experience Manager specifically for asset management as reported in this survey. We've also seen smart sheets gather momentum across many planning tools. Content planning still favors solutions that act like spreadsheets. So um, smart sheets works well for them. But we actually imagine with the high number of none of the above and other, that we're probably looking at spreadsheets like Google and Excel, they're probably still in play as well. And then lastly, the highly favored Adobe Workfront for workflow management still remains strong in the marketplace. Jira staying in there at the number two spot, you know, um, digital teams really do like using the, the feature set in Jira. But the dark horse in this race, again, smart sheets, I really think these are the ones we're going to keep our eyes on. I know that they are really kind of pushing some of their feature sets and, uh, and uh, again, dark horse, slow riser. So, you know, last year we actually saw uh, an industry-wide pledge to invest in technology. And what I love about these results is that I actually think we're starting to see the benefits of all of those investments. It is pretty cool. So we're going to move on from the new normal and we're going to get into, um, oops, I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to throw that in quickly before we move on. Um, that, oh, I'm sorry. I just that, cut you yeah, off. No, that, that investment, not only is it paying off, people are actually happy with it. So uh, in some cases, up to 70% of teams are saying that they're satisfied or somewhat satisfied with those tools. So you know, say what you want about tools, but I think that that's probably a pretty positive response. <laughs> you know, you're you're absolutely right. Um, but not to be the Debbie Downer here, um, <laughs> simply implementing the perfect software software platform, you know, it's just not, it's not enough. It's not going to get you there. To gain maximum user adoption and engagement, your tool's really going to need to be modified or optimized to work best within your company and within your company culture. Um, we would love to see a shift from that somewhat satisfied kind of grouping, moving them to the very satisfied. Um, you can do that through optimizing your tool to really make it fit with your process and, and how your team wants to work. And it really, really is going to make all the difference to your operational efficiency um, metrics. And you're going to start really seeing uh, a needle move there. Shall I move on, Amy? <laughs> yes. Now let's talk about benchmarking measurement. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So as a little bit of background about how we're talking about benchmarking measurement today, and, and it really is a little bit more about operational maturity. So the marketing and creative charter has changed dramatically in recent years as businesses have, have become much more digitally focused in the way they tell their stories and interact with customers. Operational maturity has actually improved as well. And with the technology becoming more persuasive and customer expectations for engagement have been growing, marketers and creatives must now focus on the increasing demand for deliverables while maintaining quality and efficiency to produce them. Key performance indicators, or KPIs for short, can provide an objective measure of a team's performance and allow them to act quickly to make those necessary changes in order to improve operational efficiency and effectiveness. By setting specific measurements for improvement in their operations, teams can identify areas of weakness and opportunities for improvement. In addition to helping identify and address gaps, these KPIs can provide tangible data around operational performance, which obviously can be used to inform future decision making. Yep. So now we're going to take a look at some of the actual data 
um, on how to move the needle. And all of the questions in this section are new to this year. So super exciting. Let's take a look at them through the lens of our industry focused on improving through these metrics. The most important thing, of course, to start with is that you've got some kind of a North Star and you're clear on the primary goal of your department. Marketing departments and IHAs might serve multiple marketing strategies and maybe even all of these at some point or another, but understanding what's number one is critical to guiding decisions on prioritization and resourcing and being able to tie metrics to your success. So with 65% of teams actually focused on supporting acquisition and sales, we should be able to get to some metrics pretty easily since both of those have hard numbers attached to them. And what we're seeing in the most advanced teams is they're connecting the dots between output and outcomes there as well. So as you mentioned, this is a new question this year. Um, we don't have year on year data yet. I'm, I'm actually really watching that um, storytelling brand awareness category. And I feel like that's going to be the one that needs to kind of tick up as a primary objective. So as customers crave that emotional connection and marketers try to meet them there, that's a stat that I, I feel like I want to keep my eye on. Yeah, I agree. Um, considering what we learned today about the importance of employee retention, it's really good to see that 50% of teams are measuring that satisfaction. Um, so along with financial impact, there's a series of volume and efficiency measures that are a fast follow in the prevalence of industry best practice measures. 34 to 37% of teams are tracking metrics against output project management, and client partner satisfaction. So this is a great foundational set and teams who are tracking these, um, especially more than two or three of these, are, are well above average on the uh, average operational mat maturity. You know, I mean, like I see this client partner satisfaction at 34%. I would love to understand a little deeper what people are actually doing with those employee satisfaction results. You know, if, if you can have an understanding of where your employees are unhappy, um, you're actually able to make a significant boost to your team's culture and turn around productivity simply by addressing a few pain points. You know, make some song and dance around it and let people know that you're hearing, listening and responding to things that your team members are frustrated with. Yeah. Um, so moving on from industry standard measures to the measures that are most important to people, when we look at what folks say are the most meaningful, it's no surprise that volume, capacity, and utilization related metrics rise to the top with 58% of teams ranking them highest. They're, I mean, they're so foundational to improving the efficiency of the team, to securing resources, and in, in many ways, they underlie and support all of the other uh, measures that we, that we look at in operations. Mm -hmm. um, on the plus side also, we are seeing a high level of confidence in the data that teams are capturing with 69 to 90% at somewhat or very confident, you know, kind of depending on the metric. So interestingly, or maybe not as interestingly, utilization came in the softest confidence level with that 69%, which is still pretty confident, but not as high as 90. We think that's simply because the natural variation in individual work styles makes it harder to achieve the same level of precision in the measure versus something like project count. Um, so as you recall from an earlier slide, despite this being a little squishy, it's still capacity and utilization considered to be the most valuable and meaningful to teams. So, you know, thinking about time capture, there's a term I always like to use. Um, it comes from the idea of utilization and it's understanding the concept of honest entering by your team members. There's still just a lot of fear in general um, with time tracking. People think that there's kind of a big brother approach um, so I do think that there's probably some communication that can happen in a lot of organizations to help people understand how that information is going to be used. Um, you know, with honest entering, 
you're able to see when your resources are going to be fully tapped and actually get them the support they require. Um, you know, if your team is feeling stressed about the, their workload, time entering with honest entering is actually going to be their best friend. So maybe it's a communication around that that we just need to try and help focus on. Yeah, that could be it. So this core set of metrics can be thought of as sort of the baseline activities to support the ongoing improvement of your operation. So not surprisingly, teams today are stronger in the operational measures with 48% measuring than they are in the performance and the customer interaction data with just over 30% of teams um, looking at those. Um, I, I think as dedicated marketing operations grows in prominence at in-house teams, it's bringing together the marketers, the creatives, the analytics, the channels. Um, I think we're going to see those two dots between performance and operational measures um, connecting a little bit more. For sure. I mean, again, I, I would love to see organizations take that next step in their operational maturity. You know, you take these minimum viable metrics and then you start laddering them up to really match up to um, efficiency and e efficacy. Uh, key performance indicators, which as we all know, can contain one or more metrics within them, can really start to establish measurable goals. Um, and with some like key gate points, we can actually start to demonstrate movement towards our goals. Yeah. And again, this is where marketing operations is perfect to play that in between role. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. When we think about um, operational maturity, um, we look at teams who are utilizing strategic objectives, KPIs, and mission vision statements as the sort of the highest on the operational maturity scale, since everything else necessarily files out from them. So it's great to see more than 50%, 53% of teams showing up with at least one of these. Um, this data says to me that the industry leading marketing departments and IHIs are, have definitely built some operational muscle. And I believe that in turn makes it easier for the rest of teams to follow on pretty quickly because best practices do tend to, you know, to spread in the industry. And we are a community um, after all. Um, so we predict a pretty quick uptake in these building blocks in the, in the coming years. Love that. Customer feedback. It's really interesting to me that those came in completely dead evenly split at the haves and have nots when it came, when it comes to access to customer sentiment data. Um, but what's actually more interesting is this 14% that said they don't know. So we're wondering, is this, is this data that the teams are receiving, but they don't recognize it as that? Um, does the data exist in the company, but marketing doesn't have it or isn't aware? We're definitely going to be digging deeper on on this in the in the coming months. Sophie, I know, I, I think you have some interesting thoughts on this one too. So yeah, I mean, I'm a little in the dark. I'm not entirely sure how you you don't know. But, you know, when you look at the breakdowns of the don't knows by role, this functional leader at 36 percent, I just find that super curious. So these are the folks who are actually doing work. They should be, you know, they're the ones who are going to be designing and building the creative assets, the content, the, the messaging. The getting that customer feedback information specifically to those people, I think, is the most important group to get it to. That seems like a pretty large chunk to to not know. Again, I'm I'm super curious why the leaders of those functions, um, management roles, operations management, head of the in-house agency, creative director, that they don't know if they can get customer feedback. And maybe maybe the work type that they're doing doesn't need it. I just think that the the shift to growth marketing practices, to gaining um, market share through emotional customer engagement is so top of mind right now that this fundamental piece of information, if it's not getting to your team members in these particular team members, you really do need to try and help figure that out. Um, it's going to make a difference. It's going to shift the needle. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. 
Let me get off our soapbox on that one. (laughs) Yes. Now let's move on to our next soapbox, moving from external customers to internal. So whatever you call them, clients, partners, business owners, whatever, making sure that the IHA is meeting the needs of those people is a critical measure to success especially as we've been harping on this this session as well, given the current focus and importance on building collaboration between creative and marketing. So no special technology is needed to execute a survey, yet 46% of teams are not surveying at all. So this is definitely a missed opportunity, low hanging fruit, and a great place to start a metrics program for anyone who doesn't have one started yet. You know, not that I still have a sore point about the sharing files through email, but at least we know that people have email and you can use email to start surveying your client partners. I'll let that go now, too. So, Amy, thank you. I really enjoyed this brand new section. Metrics and data are just so important. And I think they're really only going to increase in, in importance in the future. You know, remembering that that was that promise of investment. We've seen the investment coming in. That, that investment in, into technologies um, is giving us access to all of this critical information. It's a wonderful outcome of that investment. Not only is it making it easier for us to collaborate, but it's giving us data that's likely going to end in such operational efficiency. You can honestly pay for the technology that it was, that was purchased to support it in the first place. So really great section. We really hope that you guys all enjoyed that section as much as we did. Um, but we need to move on, um, to our next section. Yeah. Let's talk about what's next. Yes. So clearly that partnership between marketing and creative departments is a super hopeful start to a welcome trend for next year. You know, quite simply by increasing communications, having integrated tools and collaborative planning, the strategic quality and time to deliver is only going to improve. So let's have a look at some key metrics that should support this trend. So apparently, the news of Prince's death has been greatly exaggerated. In fact, 91% of teams are still reporting that they're doing print design. And this is great, right? In a data-driven marketing environment, if your metrics show that it's effective, you should absolutely keep doing it. Um, We also see more teams mixing their offerings of traditional tactics like that email design, social media design, um, with more cutting edge digital digital tactics, kind of like um, AVVR, live streaming, and we're even seeing a little push, a little toe dip into the NFTs. Yeah, totally. Um, So I I guess I see it as what's next for marketing and creative here is a mandate that teams offer a range of services from the tried and true to the like, why not try? Yeah. Um, So how broad is that set of tactics being executed? Um, That broad set of tactics is largely being executed through flexible staffing. So of teams that don't use flexible staffing, 36% cite lack of budget as their primary reason, which is especially interesting compared to last year's difficulty in staffing quickly. Um, Also, in order to preserve budget, it looks like teams who are able to utilize flexible staffing are looking for talent who bring a broad and diverse skill set versus niche and specialization. We expect this also to continue as part of what's next. So also what's next? Again, looking at how that collaboration between marketing and creative departments deepen is going to be the need for new roles. And those new roles are really going to sit at the seams of where those two teams meet. So behavioral scientist roles still look extremely rare. Uh, as well as 43% of teams have no dedicated customer insights roles. So, you know, as an industry, these roles, they're more than just aspirational. They can have a meaningful and measurable impact to your um, efficiency and effectiveness in your data-driven marketing and creative teams. So now's the time to add them so that you can start to reap those benefits in 2024. Another key role for kind of 
future-proofing your team is that dedicated analyst role, critical to making some actionable information from that lake of data. So we see this as another critical um, next level addition in your, your org chart. So, um, oh, I'm trying to move my, one second, I'm having a little hard time moving forward. There we go. There go. We got there. Sorry about that. So, earlier today, um, we saw the overall team size, they're indeed growing. However, the talent mix has also started to shift. Again, I'm imagining that in the response to the current economic climate, there's a hesitance to keep on and maintain just so many FTEs. Um, but with over a 10% drop in those FTEs, we're seeing an increase on contingent, contingent labor. So as you're starting to move, into some contingent labor, there are some other considerations that you're going to need to start thinking about. Those are things like labor laws, term limits, you know, um, contingent labor, you're going to be getting them in, but you're going to want to keep them on as long as possible so that you reduce your onboarding and maintain your institutional knowledge. So there's many different ways that you can get that contingent labor and that flex staffing from just contracting an independent contractor to actually having more of a managed service, an embedded team, and even outsourcing to an overflow studio. Um, a mix of these types of resources can be an, a, a real option for many. And as a shameless plug, I'd just like to draw your attention back to that earlier slide and what seller can offer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, my button's just not working. Give me one second. Oh, there we go. All right. Oh, there we go. Of uh, Yeah, tech. So you can't really talk about what's next without thinking about tech. Um, it's great to see so many teams, 65% planning on continuing to invest. And then building on that investment that teams are reporting, we're seeing a steady increase in enterprise uh, level, enterprise level asset management solutions, 3% up over last year, in fact, com of companies that are delivering DAM that encompasses not just creative, but creative plus marketing, plus the enterprise beyond. So this is really deep support of collaboration across teams, and it's moving teams in ever closer to, you know, sort of this holy grail of seamless, seamless integration. And that focus on integration today should inevitably leave, lead to collaboration tomorrow. 65% of teams, in fact, are either, either are or are planning to integrate project management with DAM and content calendar. And wow, like we can't really, we're so excited to see how this plays out for everybody. And, and we will uh, look forward to hearing from you on it. Wonderful. So um, there you have it. What you have seen in today's um, report, it represents just a few of the key data stats that we've gathered and are able to report on. This year, we've created an interactive experience with the data. You're actually gonna be able to log in and play with some filters yourself to drill down to data that applies directly to your team size and business needs. So look it out for- It's super, it. super cool. Sorry to it's interject cool. there, but I'm super excited about it. No, it is super cool. Um, we have a phenomenal marketing department and we love them dearly and they found this amazing experience. So cannot wait to share that with you. Um, look out for that email access to that, um, that platform uh, in early May. Um, so we've really enjoyed sharing what we found super interesting facts and some key points, but now we have about 10 minutes to go through some questions uh, from you guys. So I know that you've been putting some in the chat. Um, so I'm going to start calling some up and we'll discuss them. So they, um, Amy, the first one I have here, do these larger in-house teams also struggle to be nimble with these shorter planning sprints and periods? 
one thousand percent yeah the 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 beauty of getting big is scale and efficiency and the trouble with getting big especially in a big org is uh, the the challenge in moving quickly particularly when you think about the number of decision makers and people who have to you know chime in on any on any given project so we we think about that in a number of ways and and think about breaking teams uh, into tiger teams and uh, pods has become sort of a dirty word, but the concept of, of smaller, more nimble or lowercase a agile um, can often work really well in, in big orgs like that to speed things up. Yeah, I am. Um, absolutely. So um, is the shift to more quarterly planning, this is a little associated, is the shift to more quarterly planning aligned to quarterly business performance measurements? You know, we didn't ask that question specifically, but it's a very good thought. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it. I think it's a. I think it's directionally probably true to to Sophie's point. We didn't actually ask that question, but um, you know, when I think about my experience over the last ten years and in, in in big marketing departments, uh, budgets were being doled out much closer to the time of activities than they had been before. So if that's not happening, the budgeting and the planning on a quarterly basis together, um, then I would expect that to be part of what's next. There's another question here that I think is kind of interesting. Someone was surprised to see ROI being so low in the ranking of meaningful measures. Any insights why? And I'll give you my thoughts first and then Amy, you can share what you think from, from your viewpoint. I'm, I'm thinking that the folks who answered that probably come from more of the creative in-house agency side, less so on the marketing side. And that's really where kind of the two, the two um, areas of business differ the greatest. Creative has largely been focused much more on quality brand, um, brand standards, and uh, you know, pull through productivity, with marketing really being responsible, focusing on the ROI, um, and that's why they're asking for certain tactics to be delivered. However, with the joining or the coming together of marketing and creative, what's interesting to see is ROI is starting to to tick up, so that it's becoming actually more important to both sides, and that's where we think the real kind of uh, future lies in in turning a, a significant corner in improving the potential of ROI through um, creative design with ROI as a strategic goal. Uh, I would speculate that one possibility is that as more creative teams are becoming a cost center along with marketing, right? Reporting into marketing that the ROI of the agency itself matters less because it's sort of the, it's, it's an in-house group of people, you know, that you, that you don't have to um, bench against. That's, that's one thing. But I think if it's about projects, if, if you really wanted my honest answer, it would be that many people just don't know how to get to ROI. So they put it at the bottom of the list. So, Amy, I have I have a question here for you. I think it's for you um, because I know how passionate you are about this. So how would you describe the difference between marketing ops and creative services or in-house agency ops? Or do most orgs have one and not the other? Great question. You're right. I do love this question. I think of marketing operations, as I said, um, you know, speaking to that slide earlier, I think of it as the umbrella of operations over all of the things in a marketing department, creative being one of those things. So marketing ops is pulling all of the levers, coordinating all of the different functions within marketing, again, creative being one of those. Creative operations is also very specialized to creative. So they're serving creative specifically with metrics, with workflows, with um, talent and development, whatever it is that they're charged with, but it's very specific to creative. Creative is one constituent in a marketing ops purview. Thank you. 
I knew you'd like that one. So um, here's a question. Um, do you have examples of surveys we can use? Um, we already survey, but it'd be great to see if we're missing a few blindly obvious questions to ask. So um, I feel like I've done so many shameless plugs, but I really kind of have to use one in this instance. So here at Sella, we actually do have an array of surveys that we use in different circumstances. Um, the way that we go about surveys is a couple of things. Firstly, we kind of understand what your goals are, what you want to know, and you know what you're willing to do about things that you you uh, you discover. Uh, there's no point in asking questions and getting information back on something that you're just not willing to change. So we think about what we want to know. Then we um, create a survey. We discuss whether it should be anonymous or not. And then we um, think about we think about the um, the way that we ask because what we actually what you want to be able to do is find out pain points that you can provide an action or a solution to. Um, so you know, in our kind of um, stores of of surveys, we surveys we surveyed hundreds hundreds of teams um, in hundreds of companies so we do have a list of best practice questions to ask um, and also in a way of asking them based on the culture of your organization um, an organization that's very hierarchical and then in their culture by nature is going to respond differently to questions that is a bit more of a flatter organization or maybe one that has better peer-to-peer -peer communication so um short answer yes we do have many examples um, you can easily reach out, um, drop us a note. Uh, we can have somebody reach out to you specifically and um, we'll get you some information. And then I have here, um, a lot of client communications are through sales and marketing and often doesn't get received by creatives. So I think that must've come from that question that, you know, Amy, you and I were confused about um, regarding people who just don't know they have client feedback data. I actually, I see a question in here that I think you might like, Sophie. The question is, are there any suggestions on change management when introducing new tech? Oh my gosh. So yes, I do have a soft spot for that one. So yeah, there are, there's a thousand. Um, we actually have a whole presentation on change management when introducing new technology. I mean, there's things from um, inclusions, and surveys and rolling out whether or not by feature or by minimal viable um, uh, feature set and then rolling out the full thing. So yes, there are tons. Uh, and I would have to say that um, I, would, I would love to have a conversation with whomever asked this question because it can be, it can be delicate. You know, in, in my past, I've rolled out new tech a bunch of times and uh, I've tried many different styles. My, um, my personal favorite, but least effective is the, because I say so approach, um, <laughs> but it never ever works. Um, and it's constantly, you know, dropping ideas, giving some suggestions, ideating with people. It can be a slower process. Now, I mean, there are two ways. There's the band-aid approach of like, well, work's not gonna happen if you don't use it. Um, that basically results in immediate and massive uproar, but it dies down just as quickly. Um, and then there is the kind of like slow and steady approach where you're bringing people gently along. And that is gonna take a little longer. However, you're gonna realize that um, people are still gonna have questions and reservations um, and you're kind of gonna, you know, use kindness, inclusion, and a little bit of healthy bribing with uh, additional breakfast bagels or maybe sending cookies to people's home just to help them feel like they should use it. Uh, bribery is, is what I'm going with there. Um, so yes, lots of suggestions. We really need to know more about your culture, what the tool is, what the tool's expected to do and how much involvement they would have with it. So there are more questions here. We've got, um, my countdown says 23 seconds of time remaining. So what I would like to say is,
Thank you so much for your attention today. Amy, thank you so much for your participation. Marketing yeah, team, marketing team, thank you for putting this together. And anyone whose questions we didn't get to, we promise we will reach out to you directly to respond to your question. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great day.